Hello, I'm Max Kaiser. Welcome to the Kaiser Report. Markets, finance, rebels. I've got two headlines for you this past week. Tell me if you notice the similarities. Sim Headline one, Congo rebels surround central bank in Goma. Headline two, Goldman Sachs takes over the Bank of England. Notice the similarity. How about this? M23, Mark Carney. M23, Mark Carney. The news is not only repeating itself, it rhymes. Stacy. Yes, Max, and I've got my rebel outfit on here, and the first headline is Congo rebels surround central bank in Goma. Congo rebels appeared to be looting the central bank in Goma after refusing to withdraw from the city they captured last week. M23 fighters surrounded the bank early this afternoon and were seen loading white bags into cars. The armed rebels looked nervous and ordered the Guardian to leave the area. They're looting the bank, a UN source said. Later, another UN source denied that there had been money in the bags, insisting they were full of beans. A lot of these central banks are collateralized by beans. That's, uh, that's uh, similar to the Bank of England. Mark Carney is going to be arriving to the Bank of England in a few short months, and he'll find that in the vaults are bags of beans and some of Boris Johnson's wigs. Uh, but other than that, there's nothing to collateralize these banks. So, yes, of course, you've got incredible similarity. Central banks are being looted. Uh, the rebels, whether they're in Africa or in uh, England, uh, the, 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 the motive is the same. Of course, there are bean counters at the central banks in the West. So Goldman Sachs takes over the Bank of England. This is Mark Carney, of course. He is from Goldman Sachs. He was there for 13 years. And after that, he was at the Bank of Canada, and now he's at the Bank of England. Um, now, this headline comes with this map. As you can see in the above map, go government sack stretches from the tip of Crete now to the windy wilds of Thurso, Scotland. Now, you see all the, the Goldman Sachs alumni who are now running Europe, whether it's Papademos in Greece or Monti in Italy. But the one I want to point your attention to is Mario Draghi, who is, of course, the head of the ECB. But he was the chairman of the Financial Stability Board from 2009 to 2011, whereby he then gave the chairmanship to Mark Carney. Now, the Financial Stability Board has been in the news lately because they are the ones that monitor the shadow banking system. They're the ones that recently found, oops, we found six trillion extra that we didn't know existed before. So now I believe Mark Carney will be maintaining that position, uh, running that authority, the Financial Stability Authority, as well as the Bank of England. There's a clear conflict of interest there. Mervyn King was easing off on quantitative easing. Uh, signaling that he would allow interest rates to resume their normalized uh, rates in the 4 and 5 percent, which would force the economy to have to pay its way here in Britain instead of relying on handouts and welfare from the Bank of England and the city. Uh, so naturally he had to go. Uh, he had to walk the plank to bring in a dove, uh, Mark Carney, who will introduce unorthodox uh, central banking techniques, more in the style of Ben Shyster Bernanke, uh, which is horrible for the UK pound. You see, it's a poison chalice for Mark Carney. Either he raises interest rates to defend the pound, of course, causing a real estate crash, or he goes down the path of allowing the pound to be debased. He's going to actually, here's what I predict. I predict Mark Carney will, will devalue the British pound by 25%. He's going to force a currency devaluation as part of these currency wars. That's my prediction from Mark Carney. He won't do the right thing by letting the economy work through natural interest rate rises. No, he'll do the wrong thing and devalue the British pound. Again, you know, he was part of the Financial Stability Board up until I assume now. And that's where the shadow banking system is. So I think that it's a, something that we should look for because we know that a lot of the shadow banking has moved to London. So I think it's something that they're worried about. It's something to look for for the future as this collapse goes well, the on. The shadow banking system relies on 0% interest rates. Yeah, yeah. He, he's going to retain his conflict of interest. He's going to retain financial stability authority position. That's a huge conflict. So, and you got Goldman, as you pointed out, stretching all across Europe, all across the world, to create a new ice age in economic growth due to 0% interest rates, which have the equivalent of, you know, below zero temperatures in the 
ecology, bringing in the ice-like conditions of no growth, frozen, frozen, due to these kleptomaniacs like Mark Carney. Of course, one cannot really continue talking about such an important new appointment to the head of the Bank of England without talking to the taxi driver to find out what the man on the street thinks about Mark Carney being appointed to the head of the Bank of England. Be afraid. Be really, really afraid. George Osborne has named the next governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney. Mark Carney, the head of... They, they have given... They have given a man who worked for Goldman Sachs for 13 years access to the printing press of the British pound. Can you imagine that? He'll be there all day. He'll be divvying it up with the banks. There won't be, there'll be more quantity of easing. There'll be more bailouts for the banks. They, George, this isn't going to change anything. This isn't about reining in the banks. This isn't about restructuring the banks. This is about letting them loose. So the artist taxi driver there was recognizing that not only we're going to have more quantitative easing, but we're also going to have less regulation. But the mainstream media is saying, like, Mark Carney is great because the Canadian economy is so great because, of course, their housing bubble has not collapsed. The latest statistics show that Vancouver, for example, is the second least affordable housing market on earth after Hong Kong. So once that bursts, of course, let's see if his reputation does the same thing as what Alan Greenspan's does. Because right now they're saying he's as good as Alan Greenspan was during his heyday. But Let's look at what the bankers themselves think, because that's the most important thing. Remember, bankers hate somebody like Paul Volcker, who took them on. Let's see how the bankers feel about Mark Carney, whether or not he's really tough or not on regulation. Mark Carney, a significant positive for banks, says analysts. In a note to clients, UBS said the surprise decision to hire Mark Carney was a significant positive turn for both the economy and the banks. UBS said it did not expect Mr. Carney to be as tough on lenders as his predecessor, predicting an end to what it called an increasingly challenging UK regulatory agenda. Well, it's appropriate his name is Carney because he's overseeing a circus freak show <laughs> of central bankers having their way in the derivatives market, in the shadow banking system, creating all kinds of contortionists out there in the central banking land and half-naked ladies. And in this case, with Mark Carney, he's a hermaphrodite of banking because he wants both higher interest rates and looser uh, monetary policy. He's a financial <laughs> hermaphrodite. Uh, you know, they should put him in the... He'll, he'll work perfectly in the city freak show on Threadnittle Street. There's Mark Carney, the bearded hermaphrodite. He wants higher <laughs> rates and looser monetary policy. Welcome to the freak show, Mark Carney. We're, we've got your number, and we're going to flay you on this show every single week because that's what we do best. Welcome to the freak show, Mark Carney. Well, you know, in Goma, the M23 had a press conference. So here are the rebels, they had a press conference issuing their demands. And this is exactly what we're seeing here, is the Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan keep on holding these audacious press conferences, issuing their demands to the population that is the true you know, population and voting population and the, the sovereign nation. The Goma Central Bank uh, gets it. They, they hold press conferences, they have beans as collateral, they make uh, all kinds of pontifications and uh, lordly, lordly statements. Uh, well, how come Nigel Farage is not down there in Goma, you know, standing up for the central bankers in Africa, for their ability to be independent? Uh, you know, I mean, this is uh, the cross, the, the panorama, the pan-central banking nightmare that is the global central banking system. Here's Mark Carney. He's been brought to the Bank of England from the Bank of Canada. Now, it reminds me of last year. This is the last time I really heard his name in the news when that was September 2011, when Jamie Dimon tirated against this man, calling him anti-American for his anti-American rules of Basel III, that there's no way Americans are going to institute these regulations about capital requirements. So you want to see about this sort of rebel-style press conference, who wins in the end? Headline from only two days ago, Europe to push for Basel III delay as it lobbies U.S. Europe is preparing to follow the United States in delaying the introduction of stricter rules on bank capital while it lobbies for a rethink of the U.S. stance, according to reports. So these Basel III requirements of higher capital requirements 
<laughs> for the banks. They don't have any, right? But they're supposed to come into effect January 1st, 2013. But the U.S. has said we're not going to do it. So now Europe isn't going to do it. And the amazing thing about this Basel III story is that the central banks want the commercial banks to buy more or do more swaps with the central banks. But the only way they can do that is if they allow government paper to be revised upwards in terms of its percentage on the central on the commercial bank's balance sheet to give them the ability to use it as collateral to take on more debt from the central banks. So the Basel III actually gives the the commercial banks a greater ability to bail out the central banks that of course are now sitting on tens and hundreds of trillions of dollars worth of toxic debt. So not ha again it's an hermaphrodite policy it's to it's to push me pull you from dr doolittle it's going in two directions at the same time the fact is these basel three requirements are just a joke that they were ever even a public dispute over this because as we saw the global shadow banking system is Un, totally uncollateralized, and it's all the interest rate swaps, it's all the derivatives, it's all the mortgage-backed securities. So there was never any threat to having to actually abide by any capital requirements. And I think that's why they put somebody like Mark Carney and uh, Mario Draghi in to the heads of uh, two important central banks in the area where all the shadow banking has moved, because they have proven themselves to see no evil, hear no evil, and do, well, they do evil, don't they? Well, the people who are suffering austerity are the ones absorbing the brunt of the hermaphrodite banking, sexual financial terrorist proclivities of the ex Goldman Sachs bankers that are now ruling the world. And finally, I want to do a quick headline here about Jamie Dimon, follow up on him. Dimon best to lead Treasury in crisis, Buffett says. So Warren Buffett was on the Charlie Rose show where all of these new world orderists go to announce what their plans are. And he's saying Jamie Dimon, head of J.P. Morgan Chase, is the best man to head the Treasury once Timothy Geithner goes because he says, quote, if we did run into problems in markets, I think he would actually be the best person you could have in the job. World leaders would have confidence in him. So my question to Warren Buffett is, what about world populations? Would they have faith in Jamie Dimon? What about the population of Jefferson County, Alabama? What about the population of Casino, Italy? All wiped out by this man's derivatives and toxic waste. Well, like Warren Buffett's hermaphrodite friend, Charlie Munger would put it, you just gotta suck it up. <laughs> All right, Stacey Herbert, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Uh, thank you, Max. Stay tuned for the second half. I'll be talking strike debt with Andrew Ross. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to go to New York and speak with Andrew Ross of Strike the Debt Rolling Jubilee Campaign. Andrew is a professor of social and cultural analysis at NYU. He's a contributor to the New York Times, The Nation, Newsweek, and The Village Voice, and the author of many books, including Nice Work If You Can Get It and Life and Labor in Precarious Times. Andrew, welcome to the Kaiser Report. Thanks for having me on, Max. All right, Andrew Ross, first, tell us about the Rolling Jubilee. How did it start? What is the motive? And whose debt is being stricken? Uh, the Rolling Jubilee is a very, very simple idea. We raise money, we buy distressed debt on the debt market, the secondary debt market. And instead of collecting on the debt the way that collection agents do, we simply abolish the debt. And we write to the debtors in question and we tell them that they're off the hook. It's been a phenomenally successful campaign so far. Uh, in the last two weeks or so, we've raised uh, almost $450,000. And what that means is we can abolish $9 million worth of debt. Right. It's, uh, it's really a fantastic idea. And um, at the same time, you have, let's say, people like Paul Singer, who is trying to do something similarly, but in a malevolent way. He's trying to buy Argentinian debt for pennies on the dollar and then hammer the Argentinian government to pay 100 cents on the dollar. So you're really the reverse vulture capitalist. You're an angel capitalist. You're buying this debt for pennies on the dollar and this just retiring the debt, correct? Uh, I like the way you put that, Max. That's almost exactly right. Uh, we also think we're performing an act of magic by abolishing the debt in the same way that a lot of banks create money by an act of magic almost. Uh, creating money is interest-bearing debt and profiting from the results. The fact is, uh, a lot of people, especially debtors who are being hounded by collection agencies to within an inch of their lives, don't realize how cheaply 
the collection agents have bought that debt for. I mean, literally for pennies on the dollar. And yet they're allowed to extract the full amount plus many additional fees piled on top of that. In addition, uh, most debtors don't know that banks, when they discharge uh, these debts, um, they charge them off their accounts and they take a big uh, uh, tax break, which is another kind of bailout, and then they're allowed to sell the debts on this very shadowy debt market. Most debtors are not aware of that. And one of the great successes of the campaign really is that it's a public education campaign. More and more people are beginning to realize how this debt system works in frankly very predatory ways as a result of our campaign. So uh, debt uh, in many cases is uh, foisted upon individuals or mortgage holders or entire countries using very uh, dubious sales tactics or just outright um, debt um, cram downs. We, we see this in many countries. And then uh, in the cases where debts cannot be paid, the collection of those debts is passed off to a debt collection agency. As you point out, for pennies on the dollar, the debt collection agency buys those debts, those account receivable, in the hope that they can get enough people to pay off their debt to legitimize their cost of buying those debts. And we have a situation where debt is the currency of financial repression, financial oppression, and the leverage working for the creditors is on their side. But you've turned it completely around. You're saying the leverage is actually for the creditors by simply retiring the debt. You've raised $450,000 or so. You've retired over $9 million. Uh, is this something that's going to appear on crowdfunding platforms so that some people can go to Indiegogo or they can go to um, um, uh, a Kickstarter or Pirate My Film, which is my crowdfunding site, and raise money as, as somebody is doing on Pirate My Film right now to retire debt? Have you thought of that? Is, or is that already happening? Really, the, the response has been completely phenomenal. We've had thousands of messages from people who've really been touched in a very deep way, just an uplifted, just at the prospect of something like this happening, because it's an example of mutual aid in practice, people helping each other out um, on a very elementary basis, but it happens so rarely, especially when it comes to financial matters. So the response has been phenomenal, and uh, some people have even sent us a dollar. Many people have sent us just a dollar because they're broke basically, but they couldn't not send us something because their spirits had been so uplifted by this. Um, we call ourselves strike debt because we're interested in strikes against the debt system, and that can take many, many different forms, and the Rolling Jubilee is just one of those. Uh, we have other projects that we do and are working on. Um, this is a, a, a limited strike against the debt system. Uh, we're, we're not in any way deluded. That, uh, that it can bring down any system in and of itself. To do that would require much more of a critical mass and also alternatives. Any mass cancellation of debts also requires a restructuring of the debt system and the economic system in general along more progressive lines that are, that are not for profit. But Andrew Ross, what, what is remarkable here is the economies of scale of what you're doing and the leverage of what you're doing. As you point out, for every dollar that you retire, it impacts um, 10, 15, 20 times that amount face value in debt. So the, uh, let, let me uh, get to a point that is being made. Uh, folks are saying that, well, what you're doing is you're encouraging people to get into debt uh, by forgiving their debt and you are perpetuating the debt cycle. Your thoughts? We're intervening in the debt cycle in very strategic ways. Uh, we don't think we're helping people get into debt. We're helping people out. People are very desperate. People who are at the, the end of their tether, basically. Um, and there'll be many uh, hundreds of elated debtors uh, uh, who will receive letters very soon from us telling them that they're off the hook, mostly for medical debt, because that's what we've been buying initially. Um, these are people who, for one reason or another, have just been unable to pay their medical bills. Um, I and my uh, colleagues in Strike Debt don't see this as a way of encouraging people to go further into debt, especially those suffering from, um, from illnesses and, and because of the American lack of coverage in this country uh, for health insurance in general, uh, it's very difficult for people to meet their medical bills. So 
We don't really take that critique very, very seriously. What we've been more energized by is the response, the ideas that are rolling in, uh, ideas for even more ingenious tactics for intervening in the debt system, which we're very interested in and are trying to process and share with other people. Our next step really is to build uh, a national network of strike debt affiliates. There are many strike debt groups beginning to spring up in cities all across the country. And we also have international ties with groups in Europe uh, that are fighting against sovereign debt. And uh, once we have a national network in, in place, then we are able to have conversations about how to scale some of these ideas up. All right, now, uh, Andrew Ross, you're also uh, the Occupy Wall Street and Strike the Debt. We're also involved with the Black Friday strike against Walmart. Uh, how did that action go? Uh, was there any sign that the stampeding shoppers uh, noticed what was going on? Well, the Black Friday Walmart strikes is probably shaping up to be the biggest labor story of the year over here. Uh, it's, again, it's an incredibly phenomenal uh, success so far, and it looks as if it's going to escalate much further. Uh, one of the things, that, there are two things that have made it so successful. One is that the Walmart workers have their own organization called Our Walmart, Organization United for Respect for Walmart Workers. They feel it's their own organization and it's not an external union coming in and trying to organize them. Although the, the United Food and Commercial Workers Union is working very closely with them. Uh, but this is their own, their, their own organization and they've responded very positively to that where other, other efforts have failed to unionize at Walmart. The second thing which is very important is they have so many community allies, <clears throat> women's groups, immigrant groups labor groups, Occupy groups, all came out on Black Friday and have been supportive throughout and are going to continue coming out in support of these low-income workers who are some of the most vulnerable workers in, uh, in the national workforce and internationally also, of course, given uh, the scope of, uh, of Walmart, the largest employer in the world. So these are two factors, I think, that are very, very important and uh, augur very well for the escalation of the campaign and, uh, and the prospect of, uh, of successful outcomes going forward. Andrew Ross, do you think the shoppers on Black Friday understand the interconnectivity of abuse, uh, the fact that the, the Bangladesh workers in the garment factory making the clothes that they were buying on Black Friday who died tragically in a fire trying to rush out in order so that people could trample each other on Black Friday to get those uh, slave-made goods. Do people in Walmart, the shoppers, do they understand the connection there? I think certainly some of them do. Um, many of them are, are low income, they are from low income families themselves. Uh, they're part of the community from which Walmart draws its workforce. Uh, there's a lot of uh, public education going on as part of the Walmart workers campaign. Uh, everyone knows about the international sourcing. That said, there's a lot of denial about it in this country, uh, and understandably, because uh, that's the reason the international sourcing is the reason why goods are so cheap on, on the shelves of Walmart. Um, but ultimately, this will be an international campaign. Uh, there are some Walmart unions in, in Canada, uh, there are some Walmart unions even in China. Uh, the U.S. has been a um, major point of resistance for unionization uh, at Walmart, and it looks as if the tide is shifting at this point. All right, uh, one more question, and before I do, I just wanted to emphasize to watchers of the show, fans of the Kaiser Report, Strike the Debt is a fantastic global campaign where the economies of scale are being tipped in favor of those fighting against the banksters and the terrorists, the financial terrorists. And if anyone can support this campaign, please look it up on the web, strike the debt, and get those numbers up to many, many, many times than they already are, because this is one of the most brilliant campaigns I've seen over the past few years. Now, finally, uh, Andrew Ross, you write about life and work in precious times, or I should say precarious times. Most of the jobs lost during the financial crisis were well paid with benefits, while most jobs gained during the so-called recovery have been in the low paid and precarious sort. Can you speak on that? We have about 30 seconds. Uh, just one correction, Max. It's called straight debt. 
So it's strikethat.org if your viewers want to go and visit our website. Okay. Uh, and yes, yeah, I absolutely, uh, absolutely uh, uh, welcome that question. It, it may take longer to answer than 20 seconds. Uh, but again, I think uh, the pattern that we've seen uh, is very much in keeping, is in an alignment with the same pattern of redistribution of wealth that we've seen in our economy in the last 30 years. Every new wave of economic activity or loss of economic activity is reinforcing the redistribution of wealth upwards to that f famous or infamous 1%. All right, Andrew Ross, that's all the time we have from strikedebt.org. Thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. My pleasure, Max. Thanks. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Andrew Ross from strikedebt.org. You must go there and participate. The best thing I've seen in years. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.